This is Remote Ruby. Have you any remote idea as to the meaning of the word? Andrew, I haven't talked to you since last year. I know, it's been so, so long. <laughs> I feel bad, but Jason is out this week. He had a painful, painful time basically reattaching his tendon to his knee or whatever. So he is out recovering in excruciating pain, I think. But hopefully it doesn't take terribly long to recover. I don't know. It's not an easy thing to recover from, I don't think. So yeah, poor guy. Awful. Yeah. So we let him rest for as long as he needs. That's the thing. Yes. I did my part by not asking him to help me write a sequel query today. So <laughs> that's good. I just sent him memes and stuff just to occupy him at all. We went down to visit this past weekend and he was just in so much pain that he couldn't even sleep at night, which sucks. So yeah, we just hung out in the living room. He pretty much stayed in the chair for the whole time because anytime he tried to move, it was just awful. Well, the surgery went well, so I think it now is just a matter of waiting it out. Some physical therapy and stuff, I'm sure, is needed for that. But yeah, poor guy. But I was like, just be glad it was your knee and not your fingers because those are your money makers. (laughs) But the knee, though, once you do something to your knee, it's just going to be one thing after the other from like that point forward. Yeah, that's, I think, very true. Well, my grandpa like had knee issues forever for as long as i remember and like my dad has knee issues and when he was down for christmas down here with us most of the time i watch him like get up off the couch or like out of a chair and it's a process to get up because his knees are so bad and then he was telling us that his doctor got him some arthritis medicine or something that apparently was working great because i watched him get up out of the couch faster than I've ever seen him do that. And I was like, whoa. So knee problems are not fun. All right, hold up, pause. Because I just remembered, I didn't put the meat I cooked in the fridge. (laughs) All right, hold on. I just realized. Please hold while your remote Ruby host, Andrew Mason, puts away his food. Andrew Mason. Appreciates your patience. Thanks for listening to the Remote Ruby podcast. Yeah, whenever yeah. I'm supposed to be focusing on something, that's when my brain's like, hey, by the way, you remember like that thing you didn't do? And like, oh, mm-hmm. by the way, this other thing. Good news is it was cooked, so it's less likely to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like I've been feeling much more ADD lately just because of the baby. And it's like, you can't do anything without being distracted. Or like, when's the last time he ate? Is he hungry? Is he crying because he's just mad? I don't know. Yeah, it feels like that. We're always looking for like, where did his pacifier go or the burp rag or whatever, like just stuff just goes missing all the time. I'm usually pretty good at remembering like where my keys are and all that and putting things back where I know they will be there, but not with a baby. It doesn't work. (laughs) I have no idea what it's like not to have a 15 minute search for your keys every time. And yes, I know I can attach (laughs) things to it to make me help them find them. But I was reading a book over the break again called ADHD 2.0. And it was talking about like in the past, like we thought that if you did not have ADHD symptoms as a child, then you don't have it even if you have symptoms of it as an adult. But like recently they've changed a lot of their thinking around that. It's like, actually, it's really when the environment around you changes drastically. So a lot of times they'll discover that women are actually ADHD after they have a child, because that's all of a sudden when they go past the mechanisms that they've created to like function previously without interruption. All of a sudden, uh, yeah. like, these environmental factors pop up and can change your brain chemistry. That makes a lot of sense because, yeah, you're just like bombarded with things happening all the time. And that is exactly right. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Part of it, too, I know for the wife is that she wasn't able to take her regular ADHD medicine. So it just was like really painful for her to then be pregnant and like, just, okay, I guess I just have to straight deal with this now. And it's like hard to function like you normally do without that. So she's back on it now, but today was actually her first day back at work after the three months or whatever. 
it's hard to believe that it's been as of six days from now, Jackson, our baby boy, it will be three months old, which is Dang. insane. Dang. So yeah, time flies, but it's good. It's just fun to like, he wakes up from a nap and he's like all smiley when you go pick him up and it's great. Sure is a change of pace. I've been struggling to get through to even like just do work some days because either I'm tired or you just like don't want to work right now. Just want to spend yeah. time and the family and do stuff. But we're back in that back to work phase. The hard part now is need like some sort of daycare for him. And of course, all the good daycares and stuff cost a freaking arm and a leg, yeah. which is like a mortgage payment. Then on top of that, most of them are full. So there's all that to deal with. We paid to be founding members of a new one that's opening, but it doesn't open until summer. And their other location, they're building a new location, which is why we're a founding member of this new location. But we went to the other one, they gave us a tour and whatever, and we're like, we'll let you know if we have room for you. And they were like, yeah, sorry, a few days later. So it's gonna be interesting to see how that'll all work. But luckily we got family nearby and I think they'll be able to help out quite a bit in the interim. But my God, everything is expensive. It's nuts. It's wild to me that like people are able to raise children successfully by themselves. I always read the best childhood is usually built around family and structure and community. And so I just can't imagine how hard it would be, not only monetarily, but like just Oh my God, I can't imagine. The amount of like focus you have to put on your child all the time and right. then try to break away from that for 15 minutes to go live your life. Like, right. It's nuts. So yeah, I'm with you. The amount of effort people have to spend on it is wild. It's funny because one of my friends from high school that was the same grade as me and stuff, he actually just had twins a few days after we had ours. I'm like, good luck, because one's hard enough. Two sounds just yeah, so extra. So. Double the diapers, <laughs> double the food, double the tuition. Oh, my double God. Double the crying, all yeah. of that. It sounds crazy, because I'm sure it's not like you put them both down for a nap and they sleep the same right. amount of time. I'm sure one gets up early, the other one is later. And, and then if you're ever by yourself trying to manage to, oh, my gosh, can't imagine. Yeah, so. I'm scared of the idea of even trying to keep it alive. <laughs> like there's <laughs> yeah, fire and stoves and knives and like <laughs> the environment and like, oh my God. Yeah, I was too. And then at least at the infant stage, it's like they just stay wherever you put them. They can't move. But the second they can, now you got to be real worried and keeping yeah. a close eye on them and... That's going to be fun times ahead. And we don't have a lot of doors in the kitchen. We have mostly drawers. So it's like, oh, how are you going to secure all those? And baby whatever. locks. So yeah, it's going to be a lot of uh, baby stuff to get. And then we've got two staircases and they go up and downstairs. So we're going to need four baby gates on the main floor. Then maybe if we take the baby up or downstairs then we'll maybe need four more for each floor. I, I don't know. I'm just going to delay that until it's needed and just not think about it until then. You better start <laughs> pumping out some videos. You got a lot of baby gates to get. <clears throat> What's been cool is Colin and I got so far ahead planning for the baby here and then Christmas and New Year's and all of that. So we like got real far ahead on screencast to the middle of January or something. So it's been the first time in probably like eight years that I haven't recorded a screencast in a couple months. So I just did my first screencast recently. I forget what that was on. It'll be published here in a little bit, but it's been interesting because we had to definitely take some time and plan ahead. And it's been great because then that got us a lot of focus on some other things that we needed to get done. This week, we patched a whole bunch of things in pay, mainly on the Braintree side, because almost nobody uses that. So it was a little lacking in some feature quality. So we're upgrading Go Rails to use my very old, shoddy, works just fine, but not as well organized or maintained payments code. So we've like got all this stuff on the user 
now we've got it moved over to pay, but we had as part of the development process on that is like, oh, let's go and sync all the Braintree subscriptions. As it turns out, the Braintree subscription sync feature in pay doesn't exist. We built that for Stripe because that's what we use and everybody mainly uses, but nobody has complained about that being missing for Braintree yet. So I had to go build that. Then of course, Braintree has the customer ID not on the subscription. You have to go through the payment method to the customer. So there's a lot of like weird little edge cases we ran into there. And we started, you know, clone the database and test it locally to migrate the data over to the new records and whatever. And that works fine up until like user number four or something. Because if anyone is really old school Go Rails person, GoRails started as two courses. One was a free course and one was a paid course for like 40 bucks and a few people had bought that. And then I like converted it to subscriptions. So we found some user records in there that were like, Stripe subscription token is just the word free. And I had just like checked if you were subscribed by looking at the presence of a subscription ID. So I just like shoved any data in there to like give somebody a free subscription without having to build something else. But of course, you run the sync job and it's like, what the hell is this? I like go update all those and then try it again. But apparently there's somebody else that was like, oh, they get free access for six months. And so there's some other thing in there for that user and whatever. So it was a slow process to migrate because it was also like the data we stored before was just like purely the subscription ID. But to move to pay, it's like, well, let's go hit the API. Let's grab the subscription, grab all the details, grab the payment method, grab everything and put it in the database and have all of the information we could ever need. We started doing that and that took like an hour and a half or something to go through 70,000 users or something and just one by one, check them all. We were a little worried about rate limiting, but as it turns out, like the API requests are slow enough on their own that as long as you're not doing them in parallel, it really doesn't matter. So you can't hit the rate limit because it's just slow. Right. And part of that too is I think we use the expand feature. So you grab a subscription, but you also grab the latest invoice and the latest charge and some other stuff along with it, which adds to the request. Then we started the migration of charges over which were fine, but I was like, when I built the Braintree stuff, we were like, hey, you paid with PayPal, we know that. So your card brand, instead of putting Visa or Discover or American Express, we just put PayPal in there. And then for your card last four, we put your email address for your PayPal account in your card last four digits field. And it was like, this works fine, but it's not really ideal. And so that was another thing we had to go through and just like, Eh, let's sync it the proper way with pay. Let's clean up all those. Let's put these things in the email field instead. And if it's a PayPal type, then we'll look at the email, not card last four. Right. So that cleaned up a lot of things. And it wasn't an awful migration, but those were very slow to sync one by one. It probably would have been wise to do that in a batch of four threads or something. It took a while. I let it go overnight and it made it like halfway through the charges. And then before bed, I crashed to like 35,000. I was like, oh, okay, we'll stop, fix that, restart it. And then this morning, it like crashed a thousand before it was finished. And I got it all cleaned up today. But yeah, there's always something. And then, of course, I forget webhook URLs changed. I had just like slash whatever. Stripe webhooks or something like that. And now it's like the pay route for it. So it was just, oh, 14% of your Stripe webhooks in the last month have now failed. And I was like, that's a lot. And then I realized, oh, yeah, of course, change that, resend all those. Or that was automatic actually, because Stripe's oh, nice. awesome at retrying. And I caught it, got it fixed within that period of retries because they do like exponential back off. So I don't remember if it's like 24 hours or 48 or something like that. I think they give you quite a bit of time to keep up with that, but it's cool. Like 
the detail that Stripe has in their webhooks section, it's amazing. I wish everybody had that. Because you get to see like the webhooks and their overview section, which is great. You can see that you've made 80,000 successful API requests, 76 failed in the last week or whatever, two weeks. You get to see like your webhook response times, your average response times and all that. And they give you like recent errors too. So when you make an API request, so you can like actually look at the error, which is always the thing that I find really annoying about using APIs because you'll make a request and then you'll get an error message, but you might not get the full stack trace. You might actually lose the response from the API. You like run it and then you're like, shit, it didn't work. I got to go now add extra debugging lines into my code, rerun it again. Like if it's a Stripe thing, you might have to like resubscribe a user before you can cancel it and actually recreate your error. So it might take several steps. And just simply having the records of these and Stripe says, hey, this is what we sent you back. And you can just reference that and then grab it and test it in your code again. Chef's kiss. So freaking good. It just makes life so easy in comparison to almost any other API or webhooks. Their integrations are very well thought out, I think. 100%. So when you're running this long running task, how do you do that? Well, I just made it a rake task, <laughs> which was hilarious, actually, because yesterday afternoon we started it. Colin and I were pairing. I start running it. We're like, okay, I think it's close enough. And I start running it and we're like, we have the logic in here. It all sounds right, but we don't have any puts, anything to tell us what record it's on or anything. So when it crashes, we're going to have no idea what happened and why it crashed or any context. So we like run it a little bit, we stop it, add some debug lines in there, start it again and just like let it run. And that was it. So it was pretty straightforward. I just wanted something that was like easy for me to run locally and run, you know, in production on the server. It wasn't something that like if we're not running Shopify or anything, if we have a little bit of downtime while we're syncing things, that's fine. I certainly could have done this and should have, honestly, in a two-step process of let's go leave the old subscription code around that checks to see like the old locations to see if you're subscribed. But I had already like updated all the code for this migration because I needed that to test out, you know, when it's live, we need to check these other locations for your subscription now instead. So I actually just pushed all that code up and where temporarily you didn't have access to pro episodes. And a handful of people noticed that they were probably watching a video at the time or something. And I was like, just responded to a couple of those and said, hey, we're doing some maintenance. No biggie. Your subscription will be back in just a minute. And it was nice because we could kind of like watch and see it. these people are complete. We can go double check and make sure that if you paid with PayPal through Braintree, you're still subscribed, sync that properly. If you paid with Stripe, you're still subscribed. If you paid with Stripe previously, but canceled, you're still canceled. Just checking all those different situations. We also had some painful stuff too with, and this has been like a long outstanding bug of basically, if you're a student and you want to use the GitHub student developer pack to get Go Rails for free for a period of time, when you go through the OAuth process, as soon as you connect it, we check to see if you're a GitHub student and we like give you your 12 months access immediately. There are some students that come across Go Rails and sign up with GitHub and then they find out about the student developer pack stuff later on. And then they're like, hey, you know, why is there only six months left or whatever? And it's like, well, accidentally you got free access six months ago and you didn't realize it. So we like clean that up now. So that when you go through that process, only on the GitHub student landing page will it redeem your GitHub student free year of Go Rails. So if anybody is a student and wants Go Rails access for free, you can check up the GitHub student developer pack. And I think it's GoRails.com slash GitHub hyphen students. And that will get you there as well. So basically, GitHub just approves you on their side, verifies that you're a student going 
to school somewhere. And then we just check that and verify it, which is cool. Whether US East 1 is down or you forgot to add a configuration file, everyone has an outage from time to time. When your next outage occurs, transparency is critical. The difference between a minor annoyance that people soon forget and a fiasco that creates sustained resentment is in how you communicate. That's why you need Honey Badger. Honey Badger will be a crucial component of your incident response plan with their uptime monitoring service that now has an exciting new feature, public status pages. Create a new status page with custom domains, branding, and more. Don't let Twitter be the only way your users can find out if your app is down. Sign up for Honey Badger to improve your incident response with a shiny new status page that you will be proud to show your users. Visit honeybadger.io and start giving your users a better experience today and let them know Remote Ruby sent you. Thanks to Honey Badger for their continued support of Remote Ruby. This is a lesson that I've learned over time. Is like you might think you want simplicity and you might take some shortcuts. So for example, like I mentioned earlier, some of the people I wanted to give free access, like friends, the Stripe subscription ID, I would just write in free and that would be good enough. But the simplicity there was like a real pain point later on because I could never really differentiate things easily later on. I mean, I could query that pretty easily, but like the code had to check and see, is there a special value in here in this field or is there a standard Stripe subscription ID in there? And that's like easy enough, I guess, because Stripe has the prefix IDs, but you know, it's one of those situations where you're like, I should have just added a free Boolean on there. And that would have been way, way more manageable and like way easier to deal with. And I shouldn't have shoved the... PayPal information into the card last for and brand and whatever. And those are like things where I'm like, oh, do I really want to add another database column that I did as a newbie? And I was like, I don't want to do another migration. I'll just like put this in here, treat them all the same. In theory, they're similar enough. And it works pretty well for a while until you start to need to support ACH or, you know, ideal or other payment methods and things. And then you realize like it doesn't fit in the card fields anymore. And you start to see that breakdown and you kind of knew ahead of time that it wasn't the right answer and you probably shouldn't be doing this, but you're like, oh, it's quick and easy. We'll just do that and whatever. And I've definitely done that a lot in my past experience. And now I feel like I've learned the hard way not to do that near as much anymore. Like, let's stop and think through this a little bit more. Another database Boolean column is not a big deal. So we could add a free flag on there and that's way easier to manage, you know, whatever. So that was definitely one of those where I'm like, this code is very old. When I was starting GoRails in 2013, before it really became a thing in 2014, that era, I was pretty beginner Rails developer. I hadn't really built anything massive or maintained anything for 10 years and had all kinds of things change feature wise and whatever. So it was uh, lots of weird decisions like that, that you come back and you're like, why the hell did I do this? (laughs) Right. The reason I asked about how you ran the task is because I have run so many data migration tasks as rake tasks. And then in the beginning, and then I learned, oh, well, for data migration tests specifically, you actually could run it in a migration and that might be actually better for X reasons. And I'm like, okay, but I don't want to always do that. So I kept doing my rig tasks. And then I joined Podia and discovered the maintenance tasks gem from Shopify, which we use. And it is fantastic. If you've ever looked at that, check it out because it will help you do exactly what Chris is talking about. Like it can do batches for you and it can do rate limiting for you. You can pause jobs and see where they failed and like restart them at the point where they failed and see when they last ran. That's really helpful for me too. It's like if we're working and this hasn't actually happened, but this is when it would come in handy is like if Jason and I are working on a project together and we are releasing a bunch of things and it, some of it involves running like these maintenance tasks. I might like go in to run some of them and realize, oh, wait, Jason already ran these. I can see like in the log. And I don't know, I just want to call that out because it's very nice. Yeah, I am 100% with you because those are all things that 
if you've not used it before, you probably run into doing any migrations like this. So like you can do as much testing and development as you want, but when you run it against the production database, you're going to find weird stuff that it will crash on. And like mine that crashed halfway through, almost at the end, things like that. There's a lot of different ways to handle that. For example, like I wrote the rake task just to go user, find each, whatever. And when it crashed, I had the like logs and I edited the rake task in production and just said like user where ID is greater than this and then resume from that point when I had fixed the issue. And that works fine, but like having something that actually can manage it for you is much better because all of these users and subscriptions we had to migrate are all independent. They could all be done in parallel in theory. So you can get the parallelization, but also if these individual ones crash, then like the individual one crashed, but the whole thing finishes still. And you just need to go correct the ones that failed later on instead of it crashes and everything stops. And you've got to now skip to the middle to resume and try and repeat that one. But everything is dead in the water until it finishes. Those get to be really stressful. So if you're doing anything on a large data set or something that's going to take a lot of time, like that's the way to go because you're going to get all of those other benefits. It's like going to make it a lot more peaceful. And if those things fail on 5% of records or whatever, then like you can deal with that 5%. They might write into support or whatever, but at least you got the bulk of everything done instead of like the first one in that 5% fails and we still got 80% left that are just dead in the water, then you'll have a lot more support to deal with or whatever and not good. So I uh, highly recommend that. We'll have a link to that in the show notes too because it's killer. And I think the maintenance tasks was a guest episode on Go Rails by Andrea Fumera. It was. So uh, there you go. We'll have a link to that as well. That's a free episode that anybody can check out, but it's one that she recorded for us back in February last year. So about nice. a year old already. One thing I've also done with these tasks where you know that some of them are going to fail. And I haven't done this in a while. So maybe if I had to do this again, I would rethink this strategy. But you can add a column. If you're migrating all these users' payments, for instance, you can add a column on user called like payment migrated true false. And then in your task, rescue and just be like, update this record to have this set to false or just like don't set it to true. And then you have yeah. a list, a perfect list that you can like see with Metabase or SQL or however you want to look at it of everything that failed and you can go take care of that there. Yeah, that's a definitely a good one. And I think it's like very straightforward and easy to implement too, which is always a win. That's the real painful thing is like, if you don't have a way of checking, was this successful or not, then how are you going to deal with that? That would be right. awful. At the same time, it's like, well, what if we accidentally ran this twice on the same record? We want to make sure that we don't blow away the old data and we can have this safely rerun again. And luckily, like all of that stuff was cool in pay because it's like all the webhooks come in and give you like a subscription ID. And it's like, hey, this was canceled or updated or whatever it is. And we just like send every one of those to the sync method, which says, hey, thanks for the ID. We'll go look up the latest information, save it in your database. We're done. We never delete the old ones. You just always have the history of everything. And that's perfect because when we're like migrating the records over, that's what we have the IDs in the database. So we could just like, shovel them over to that code one by one and create these other records. Once all that's successful, we can ignore the column for a while so that like our Rails code will error out if we accidentally reference that or anything. And then like two weeks go by and we have no issues, then we can finally drop those columns. But we don't want to lose any data right now. We want to make sure that if anything ever went wrong, you, that we didn't even predict or expect, then we still have the full data set to like operate on. That's when things get like a lot more complicated sometimes of like, let's 
not rename the column. Let's not modify the data in the column. Let's introduce a new column and we'll transport the data over with it, whatever manipulations we need to do to it. Send all the code to look at the new thing. And then we can eventually drop the old one. But yeah, I bet you there are a lot of code bases where they've done the migration, but the old stuff just lives on forever. Yeah, I would guarantee you're right. I didn't say it, but it was implied that column you add, you remove later. (laughs) Yeah, I can imagine a lot of those are, if you need any of that time delay to like, let's just give it a week or two to verify everything still works. I can imagine those are like, okay, boss says we got to go work on this feature now. And you just end up leaving them uh, around. It's a good practice to get in the habit of and stuff. Just going through that, trying to figure out We made these decisions. How do we improve those decisions now that we know better and make that run seamlessly? It's probably something that like a lot of juniors don't really ever do. And that would be a good one to like practice if you're a junior. I know that like my big project before I got my first Rails job, I made a to do list, which was a Rails app that had a scaffold of to do's. And I intentionally made it like really shitty so that I pushed that to Heroku and I knew that I wanted to add to-do lists. But now I have all these to-dos that don't have a to-do list associated with them. So I got to backfill this to some default to-do list in a migration or something. And it was a lot of just forcing myself to like do that stuff so that I would learn the process of migrating production data around. I can't lose it. There's no drop in the database and recreating it. I got to deal with what I got. I got to decide some of those things like the to-do list is new and these to-dos belong to a to-do list and that's a requirement. So what do I do with these ones that I just have in the database? And it forces a lot of little decisions on your plate that uh, they're not big, but they're also like going to be real big when you're working in a production app and your boss is like, hey, we got to migrate 70,000 records of subscriptions over to another system. Okay, well, that's going to be one where you need to be very meticulous about it. If I had a tip for juniors, it would be put stuff in production and then like go change it. Make it intentionally bad on purpose and then go and prove it. Because I think that's not a common thing I think juniors tend to do. I struggled with this in the beginning because I was like, I want to get better at data modeling and I don't really understand how to do that. And while there are things you can learn and there's relational algebra, which I'm not interested in really, what I found really the best way to learn is like try just to build things over and like just realize where you run into issues and where your relations fall over. And like now, like a month in the future, I'm having this, like the user versus like account thing is a great example or like a team like if you start off with everyone has a user (laughs) and then you know a month down the line you're like oh wait well what about teams unless someone tells you that the only way to discover that is to like run into it yourself yeah you hit me right in the feels because that is one of the things we have to do on go rails because when i was building it and the same thing on hatchbox actually like it just wasn't thinking ahead And I remember reading a lot of like blog posts and stuff talking about you should have a user in a separate profile model or whatever. And I never could quite reconcile why I had to do that. I could understand it in the case of maybe Reddit or something where you have the posts and the user might delete their account, but Reddit still wants to keep the like comment visible or something. Those are situations where I could see like, okay, we should separate that out. It really never crossed my mind of like, we just have users signing up and we need accounts or teams and being able to share resources. That is not easy to migrate. And I had to do that in Hatchbox and stuff. But Go Rails will be getting this upgrade as well because the way that it works currently is you have a user and a user has an optional team owner ID, which is a reference to another user. And basically the subscription code just says, hey, are you subscribed? Or if you have a user or team owner ID, are they subscribed? And if either one of those are true, then you can access the pro 
episodes because you need to subscribe there. But what gets tricky about that is like you have to do like devise invitable or something to invite a user to the team. And it just gets like hard to manage and it's just not easy to deal with. So one of the upgrades we're going to be doing soon is basically all of the users who have a team owner ID, we'll see, oh, that's the team owner. We don't really have a name for that team. So we're probably just going to like have to use some generic like my team or something like that for the account that we create for their team. But we'll be able to like backfill all that. But we're also probably going to end up doing the personal accounts will also have a team of one. So anything we do like payments, those customers and subscriptions and charges and all of that will be associated to the account. So you might have a personal GoRails account. You might have a Podia GoRails account and you could be subscribed on either one. You can cancel yours if the company pays for it and yada, yada, yada. But it makes it nice because anything you want to share with any other people is just assigned to the account for the team. And then you can transfer it to another team. You could be part of multiple teams, whatever you want to do. Like it's infinitely more flexible that way. And in theory, it shouldn't be hard to backfill, but now you've got to backfill, create the accounts and then like update the subscriptions to point to the account instead of the user. And then all of the code and your views and your controllers now needs to look at current account instead of current user. And that's where it goes down the rabbit hole because it becomes like, oh, now we had to touch every single freaking file in this entire application to like move them to teams. And if we had just done that in the first place, life would have been easy. And you also have some of that, like, I don't know, there was a tweet I saw yesterday that was another one making the joke of like, you're a developer and you're like, surely I can't imagine a user ever being on more than one team. And so you write it as like a belongs to or has one or something. And then you have the situation where you need multiple. And if you didn't plan for that is also a nightmare upgrade of the code because everything that was user subscription now needs to be user subscriptions first or find or default or whatever it is got to be able to figure out which subscription out of all of these am i looking for versus just the single like user subscription and that's a pain in the butt that is a huge pain in the butt i always laugh at that one when people make jokes about that because it is another one of those gotchas that you think surely there will never be a situation that i'll need more than one of these and then yes there is and it is absolutely awful to go and find every reference to that. I'm having like war flashbacks as you're saying this. Yeah. It was either you or Ben Ornstein who first posited the idea in my brain of like, oh, well, if you're going to have users, just go ahead and make accounts. And Mm -hmm. ever since I heard that, like, that's just, I just stick to that rule until it fails me. Like, that's just what I'm going to do. I don't think it's ever going to steer you in the wrong direction. It's a little bit harder to deal with because you're like, well which account is the default if they sign in and if we don't know which account we're supposed to send them to do we send them to a landing page and they have to choose the account or do we just pick one or whatever those luckily are pretty easy to deal with you like can store the last account on their user record or in a cookie or whatever there's lots of ways to deal with it and kind of make it work the way you want and work intuitively And a lot of that too depends on what's the app? What do you want it to do? When you sign into Slack or something, it can give you, you see that list of here's all the different organizations you're a part of, which ones do you want to log into? But maybe like you log into Discord and it's just like, boom, all of them are in the sidebar, done. And you can handle it however you want. But uh, yeah, think of it ahead of time. And there's also like a lot of uh, little nuances. You know, you can easily give roles on the like join table as well in go rails you couldn't be part of two teams so there's no way like where would we put the roles for multiple teams we'd have to introduce a join table and then at that point might as well introduce accounts too and invitations are the same thing like what i hate and i hope everybody hates is 
when you send me an invite to my Gmail and I have another email that I actually want to use, it will not accept the other email address. You have to sign up with that one. I hate that. So in Jumpstart Pro, we have account invitations. It's a token. If you want to log in, you want to sign up, whatever, as long as you log into whichever account you would like, then you can accept or reject the invitation. It's never required to like be that same email. The email that you put in to send the invitation is purely that, just for sending the invitation out to the person, they can decide which account to log in with. That is one of my biggest pet peeves with invitation systems. I'm mulling that over because I can see a security argument that could be made there. Sure. If you were maybe like Zoom and it's your business account or Slack, I know they do this. Only let them sign up with, you know, at podia.com email address. That's another thing that you can implement there. But if it's just a general Twitter invite or something, you know, yeah, yeah, whatever, then let me choose. (laughs) Yeah, 100%. Well, as we kind of get to the close to the end, I built and deployed my first Sinatra app, which was fun. What did it do? So I think I talked about this on a previous episode. And if I didn't, I definitely talked about Ruby for all, but I was making a Slack bot to basically take our staging Heroku builds because you can assign webhooks to certain events in Heroku. And so we wanted to know every time that staging was built and ready to be deployed, Mm. we wanted to basically tag the user. And there's no way in Heroku to do that without building something custom. So... And originally I talked like, oh, I'm going to build this on a serverless function with Vercel. And I did that and it worked. But what I didn't realize is that in order to use a repository inside of an organization, or maybe it's just inside of a private org, I'm not really sure. I didn't really get that part. But you have to sign up for a team account in Vercel. And I did not realize Uh... that. So when I was kind of laying down like, okay, so I built this, it all works blah, blah, blah. But here's the thing that I didn't realize is that it's actually going to cost X amount per month. And I was like, but because we had already kind of had this conversation before of like, it doesn't have to be this, it could be this or this. I was like, but I had already converted it to a Sinatra app just for fun, just to try it. Because it said that you could run Sinatra apps on Vercel. I never figured out how to do that. But in that process of trying to figure that out, as I was thinking about that, I was like, well, if I could make it the Sinatra app run over cell, then I could take the app anywhere. And then if we don't want to pay this team cost, then and it won't matter. I won't be really any work. So it didn't work, but I had already written the code. And so I was like, so it will cost this amount on Vercel, or we could put it into a Sinatra app and host on Heroku for like, whatever, the lowest tier amount, basically. Yep. And so that's what we decided to do. And so I was able to basically revive an old branch, convert it back to Sinatra. And I've never written Sinatra app before. I've seen Sinatra code before. I just need a web app with one route that takes in a request and then returns a response, regardless of what happens in the middle. That's all I need. And I was like, I don't need a Rails app. That's ridiculous. I was like, if anything, I could run like a simple Ruby app using like web HTTP. I know I've seen some of those single file Rails apps in like the pull requests and issues and stuff for examples. But Sinatra really, if you're not hitting a database and you're not running any views, Rails is a little overkill for that. You could use that, but Sinatra is going to get you the same response. I guess in theory... I was just thinking like, in theory, you could, if all you're doing is responding to one route, you could probably just write a straight up rack application and even like skip Sinatra. But the benefit of Sinatra is you have the routing layer and that's pretty much the majority of what you get. You get a route and then a block that gets executed and it just needs to return like your standard rack response or whatever. And that's it. It's so slick. I love Sinatra. It just feels so clean when you're like, this is all I need. And like, this is all you get. I did make it into, I think, a rack app. At one point, I think I tried that. But when it came down to the decision of like, you know, there's documentation for Sinatra. 
there's this for like all this right, ecosystem right. is already built out versus me like spinning <laughs> my own the thing. Rack API docs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was really nice. And your point of like, I could have made a single file Rails app. Would it have taken me any different amount of time? I don't think so. Because it was very straightforward to get it working. And like I was able to add better tests because of that. And I was able to run it better like locally. I bet upgrades in the future, like Ruby 3.2 compatibility, it's like, well, unless Ruby 3.2 changed and deprecated some old syntax, your Sinatra app's just going to work just fine because there's yep. a lot less code than a Rails app behind the scenes. And those are the things that are out of your control. And if you want to upgrade to Ruby 3.2, well, you have to wait until they fix that. Whereas with like Sinatra and very few dependencies, it's like, well, they're unlikely to be doing some crazy thing there or they won't have the need for it. Right. In theory, your application's way, way more maintainable using right. Sinatra. I was very happy with it. The one thing that Sinatra definitely, I think, kind of pushes you towards is like, hey, you like just put it all in one file. And unfortunately, I can't live my life like that. I need folders, <laughs> I need modules, I need classes, I need separate files, I need unit tests. And that's the way I roll. So that's what I did. I basically made almost like my own kind of custom model classes that just send it off, do thing. And mostly a lot of it for testing, but also just because that's the way I like to compose. I like composition a lot. The only other thing I didn't do, but I thought about doing, but then decided that my team might hate me if I did. I wanted to add types just because I thought I had the mm. time. I ended up not having the time. But the way I have been recently kind of writing a lot of code, not at work necessarily, but like on my own, is doing a lot more yard docs on methods just because it increases like the VS code IntelliSense. So that alone is nice. Like you can hover over the method and see, okay, well, it accepts this and this. Perfect. Every method in that application has a yard doc on it. And so nice. I was like, because I have all these yard docs, I could basically add typing, I think, relatively easily. And maybe I'll do that on the side just for fun. But that was kind of where I left off of like, okay, this is perfect. It all works perfectly. But it would be fun to like a simple little file or basically application. You can kind of like test out some like tooling maybe or like some of the fun stuff. Yeah, that's a really good project for that because... You have a limited scope. It's going to be not a giant rabbit hole to go down with it, which is good. Right. Oh, that sounds like fun. I haven't written a Sinatra app in a long time. I used to have like little ones just to do tiny things. I had a little app that you put your email address in, it hit the Slack API and then send you an invitation or whatever. Slack doesn't have their own public invite thing. So we just built that and voila, now we've got one. And it's like, Basically two routes, the view and then the post route and hit the API and we're done. Those are, I feel like, really fun. And if you're a junior, that's a really fun thing to play with too. Like build some tiny applications and see how small you can make them. And what does life look like without all of the benefits that Rails gives you? What do I do right. to write tests and all those little things? Give you a little bit just different perspective. You'll learn other things. It's still building web apps. So you're going to be familiar with it and still benefiting from whatever you learn, but it'll be a different perspective. Pick up different tidbits there. Yeah, you got me wanting to play with that, but there's always too much to do. I'm really waiting for the pre-built. You can still compile your own Nokugiri executable or the C extensions, but the RC1, I think, is out now as of like December 29th or something. But I'm waiting for that to like finally officially drop. And then everything is going to get up to Ruby 3.2 because, man, those speed improvements, especially with the JIT, looking good. And the regex. Oh, yeah. Because that every, was what? every program is a regex under the hood, right? <laughs> Of course. I mean, I feel like now, there's so many regex. gems are using regex. Like, I feel like every time I dig like all the way down, it's like, oh, it's regex. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I feel like that will be a big improvement. Because that was a speed improvement. Is that right? And then it was, yeah, a few it was other a things? Massive speed improvement. I can't remember. Like they used a different method basically. And it basically took, I mean, we'll put a link to the, in the show notes, but 
I don't remember the original time. All I remember is the time after 3.2 and it was 0.003 seconds in execution time compared to like a substantially different number outside of that. So we'll take a, we'll take a link in the show. That's notes, good. But it's big. It's a big improvement. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that was in the announcement or whatever on Ruby Lang. So we'll have a link to that. Yeah, that is some good stuff. And I think there was like some timeout things too. If somebody was able to inject things into a regex, there's like now, or if you're running a regex on some massive amount of data that takes like more than a second to parse or something, then I believe they have some timeout functionality around that now, which is pretty cool and funny thing that you're like, we've had Ruby for how many years and you've been able to just run regex for it just takes as long as it takes with no timeouts it's kind of interesting to see that stuff i'm sure people have run into that previously what did they do did they write their own c extension to do their own like regex thing or whatever but it's interesting to see like these are kind of core features of the language that now we're i guess kind of lacking this before but it wasn't anything like super critical, but it's really nice to have. And it may be super critical for some people. I don't know. I find that interesting. Like when new features like that, that you see added, but you're like, wait, we've never had that before. This is great. It was a 10 second match in Ruby 3.1, 0.003 seconds in Ruby 3.2. That's a big difference. Basically 10 seconds faster. <laughs> That's a big difference. I mean, think of how many times that a regex could be running in your application. I mean, that That's, is... That could be a big speed improvement. It's amazing. And the graph underneath that is like Ruby 3.1 has this sort of linearly increasing... Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's like the second graph is like an exponential graph where it's like yeah. crazy slow. Quadratic almost. Yeah. And then the, you almost don't even notice the Ruby 3.2 line at the bottom. Because right. it's just perfectly flat at the bottom. It's just right. always ultra fast, which is incredible. And this is stuff too that like, we're all Ruby developers. There's a subset of the community that's actually, I guess, C developers who work on Ruby itself. And these are things that we just take for granted. We assume that like the regex matching and stuff is implemented efficiently and does a good job and whatever. And now... You see that like, oh, somebody spotted something very slow or it could be hugely improved. And now look at the free benefits that we get. But it's also one that's kind of, I wish we could contribute to that. But like, you probably need to be a pretty good C developer instead of Ruby developer to contribute to the language itself. But that said, there are so many libraries and things that are like just written in pure Ruby. So right. maybe that's not really the case. There's probably plenty of built-in uh, standard lib things that you could like work on and improve if you didn't know C. One thing I would love to see is a cleaner net HTTP interface because building yeah. a net HTTP request is always so annoying. And there's yeah. like some shortcuts for get requests, but not for like post or patch or whatever. And yeah, that always annoys me that I would love to see that get improved, but we'll see. <laughs> I never remember the syntax. And then I found an application that I used to like test API endpoints that's uh -huh. very similar to Postman has a feature that will export the query as a Ruby net HTTP request. Oh, my it'll God. generate it. It generates it. It's correct, too. Oh, my God. That's cool. I mean, honestly, a lot of the API gems that I used to grab for immediately, I don't do that anymore and try to just use net HTTP from scratch. But every time I'm like, hey, what was that old application where I wrote all of these helper methods? Let me go copy that and put it in this new app. And I just wish that I had those like helpers always available or something. Maybe I should just make a concern or, or a module that I can toss in a gem and have something that's a... I guess an HTTP party or whatever, similar to that, but I don't know. Then I'm like, here I go again, building another gem when I could just use REST client or whatever else that's already out there. Yeah. So 
<laughs> Some of them like HTTP.rb are great, but they have like C extensions for parsing the responses or whatever. And like, those are the ones where I'm like, I kind of would rather avoid that and just make it all pure Ruby. It's right. way more portable and stuff. So those are the ones I kind of tend to avoid or like, I love Faraday's mission. But Faraday's like implementation requires that everybody maintaining Faraday integrations also stay up to date and the gems are never up to date. And that gets annoying. So yeah, it's hard. Software is hard, man. Software is hard. And on that note, I think we'll see everyone next week. Yeah, I think we'll give up until next week, right? That sounds good to me. I'm about (laughs) that. All right. Oh, we'll talk to you then. Yes, sir. Later.